The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, on the roof for the Beatles' final performance. Right at this moment, this is who we are. Famed music exec Ken Mansfield sits down with Scott Ross. They came up on the roof without a sound check, but they went back down the stairs with a soul check. Plus, a preteen hitman. What made it so easy for me to stab somebody is that I put my the face of my father on every single one of my victims. And then, a hit is out for him. He says, but whatever you're, whatever you're doing, I'll roll with you. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. There are two fields I want to talk to you about. The Democratic field is growing. Joe Biden is in, and he starts at 8% in the polls ahead of President Trump. That's the big field, and there are a lot of them out there going to be fighting each other. But more important to you and me, there is a magnetic field that controls life on Earth that is shrinking at the alarming rate of 5% a decade. A slow motion disaster is helping, and it's going to be much quicker than anybody thought. The Earth's magnetic field is shifting, and North Pole is actually moving toward Russia at the alarming rate of about 40 miles a year. Well, the science uh, or scientists are saying that possibly the North and South Poles could flip and lead to uh, potentially global chaos. Dale Hurd explains. Earth's magnetic field is the basis for all modern navigation, from airplanes to satellites in space and ships at sea, even Google Maps and smartphones. If it continues to deteriorate, those systems and more are at risk. The Earth's magnetic north was moving even before it was discovered in 1831. It's a natural process driven by molten iron moving deep beneath the Earth's crust. But magnetic north is now moving so quickly that it forced the world's geomagnetism experts to update the world magnetic model a year early. If the Earth's magnetic field decays significantly, scientists say it could collapse altogether and flip polarity, changing magnetic north to south and south to north. The planet's magnetic poles are believed to have flipped before in Earth history, but never in a time with such a dependence on technology. And many scientists now say a flip of north and south is looking more and more certain. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, Dr. Hugh Ross is an astronomer and founder of Reason to Believe, and he joins us now. And Dr. Ross, I'm just delighted to have you with us. Tell us what this whole magnetic field is. And you said this is one of the unique characteristics of why the Earth is so important. Tell us about it. Well, Earth has a strong dipole magnetic field, and that prevents water from being lost from the Earth, also protects us from the deadly radiation from both the sun and cosmic rays. And these reversals that we've been hearing about, they've happened several hundred times in the past half billion years of Earth's history. And we already have a pretty good idea what's gonna happen during reversal. It'll be similar to what happened in 1859 when we got hit by a big solar flare. I mean, the magnetic field weakens, um, but there is a paper published by a Harvard astronomer just a couple of weeks ago making the point that as long as these reversals are short-lived, uh, it does no damage to life on Earth uh, or to our water loss. And we've survived several hundred in the past, but it will have significant consequences uh, for our high technology civilization. I mean, for example, something similar to what happened in 1859 would happen today, it would probably knock out several of our GPS satellites. Uh, and it would definitely disrupt communications. The biggest consequence is the damage it could do to our electric power grids. And so I think it would be wise in view of the fact that we know this is gonna happen in the relatively near future to take steps to protect the world's power grids. That will cost a few billion dollars, but that's a whole lot less than experiencing a shutdown of our electric power grids for months or years. Well, you mentioned about the desiccation thing. If it's really severe, uh, the, if we lose the magnetic field, the, 
that we would be subject to solar flares that could dry up our oceans. Could you talk about that? Well, again, as long as the, if we lose our magnetic field for a significant period of time, yeah, it would have uh, catastrophic consequences uh, for animal life on planet Earth. And it's one thing we notice is we got our strong dipole magnetic field just before God created the first animals. I mean, the timing uh, was remarkable. Uh, so, but what this paper from a Harvard astronomer indicates is that as long as the reversal is relatively short-lived, you know, decades or hundreds of years, it's okay for life on planet Earth. However, it's not okay for a high technology civilization and it'd definitely be worth our while to spend some money to protect the power grids. I mean, for example, in uh, 1989, there was a solar flare that knocked out the Quebec power grid, and it cost many billions of dollars. And what's happened is the Quebec government has now put in the protective measures. So if that happens again, the power grid stays up. The rest of the world's power grid is not protected. So given uh, that these kinds of events, I mean, we had a solar flare like we did in 1859. Regardless of whether we get a magnetic reversal, we get the same consequence. We now have the research to know what we're going to face when this happens, and we can take appropriate uh, preventive measures to ensure that our high technology civilization uh, remains intact. You said that the cost would be a few billion dollars. But the, the uh, consequences yeah. of knocking out a power grid would, <clears throat> would be in the trillions of dollars. Would it? Uh, is Congress doing anything about this? Uh, well, I think this news of the fact that we may be coming into a, a magnetic reversal uh, may get attention uh, from the world's governments and say, maybe we need to take some steps to prepare. Um, you know, just like we prepare for uh, fire disasters or flood disasters. This is something that we know is inevitable. I mean, for example, we get solar flares like we got in 1859 every few hundred years, maybe less. So it'd be wise for us to take steps to protect. And the remarkable thing is we're living at the optimal moment in the history of the sun where we get the fewest number of such uh, flares uh, that happened in 1859. So that's a blessing that we're living at the optimal time in the sun's history. Nevertheless, uh, we should build our house on the rock and not on the sand and take steps to prepare. What about the incidence of cancer? If this uh, magnetic field is weakened, is the incidence of cancer more uh, prevalent among human beings? Well, during a magnetic reversal, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth could decline to 40% of its present value. The worst case scenario is 5%. In either case, given how uh, you know, brief these events are, it's not gonna significantly impact our health. I mean, if it were to last for uh, centuries on end, probably the thing you would notice is your crop productivity would drop a little bit, uh, maybe 10, 20, even 50%. Uh, but in terms of human health, uh, it would have to be down at the 5% level literally for centuries before we would notice a significant uptake in cancer. The real danger is what's going to happen to our high technology civilization. Uh, is there uh, anything that uh, humans can do to, to prevent this? I mean, this magnetic field is in our core. There's no, nothing we can do to, to change this polarity, can we? The only thing we could do is go into the interior of the Earth and change what's going on there. Uh, that's not feasible. Uh, and again, this has happened hundreds of times in the past half billion years. Life has survived just fine. Uh, so this is not catastrophic to life. We can't see a single extinction event that's tied to any of these magnetic reversals. Uh, so again, I think the best thing we can do is uh, take measures to uh, protect our power grids. Uh, one last question. What about this business about the North Pole shifting? And it goes, as I understand, as much as about 40 miles toward Russia. Am I correct in that? Yes, I mean, uh, the, the North Magnetic Pole is uh, heading towards the North Pole. Actually, it means that uh, your compasses are more accurate than they were 30, 40 years ago. So in one sense, that's a good thing. Uh, but yeah, it's continuing to move. And uh, that, that's always a sign that you might be heading uh, towards a reversal. And uh, anybody who's interested in this, I've actually written a detailed article on this coming reversal uh, in my blog called Today's New Reason to Believe. You can get that at reasons.org. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Appreciate so much your being with us.
Uh, we're just, just thrilled. He's teaching a course, by the way, that's being uh, compulsory for all of the divinity students at Regent University called Cosmology. We're talking about the origin of the cosmos, where it's come from, and we've got distinguished scientists teaching it, and it's really tremendous. Well, Terry, we've got more news beside the magnetic field. Well, we do. That's pretty big news. Though. Big news, all right. <laughs> well, coming up, another Democrat is tossing his name into the presidential ring, and he's already at the top of the polls. Former Vice President Joe Biden shares why he's running after this. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Former Vice President Joe Biden joined the crowded Democratic race for president today. Releasing a video on Twitter, Biden came out swinging against President Trump. We are in the battle for the soul of this nation. I believe history will look back on four years of this president and all he embraces as an aberrant moment in time. But if we give Donald Trump eight years in the White House, he will forever and fundamentally alter the character of this nation. A morning console political poll has the 76-year-old Biden leading President Trump by eight points in a theoretical matchup. Well, Democratic candidates are proposing a wide range of health care reforms, including getting rid of private health insurance in favor of a government-run program. Next week, Democrats make their case in the House, uh, in House hearings, rather. CBN News Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson has more on their big plans. One thing Republicans and Democrats do agree on is that the American health care system is broken. Republicans and even some Democrats contend that replacing what's broken with a government fix is a recipe for disaster. Health care is a human right, not a privilege. Yes. Ever since the Democrat frontrunner unveiled his single payer plan, it has become the central campaign issue of 2020. The best way to go forward, in my view, is through a Medicare for All single payer program. Now, Bernie Sanders is taking the Medicare for All plan on the trail. We need to have Medicare for All. That's just the bottom line. California Senator Kamala Harris is also so clamoring for a government health care takeover. And having a system that makes a difference in terms of who receives what based on your income is unconscionable, it is cruel, and in many situations that I have witnessed, inhumane. But the vision of more affordable coverage that lowers the number of uninsured is meeting a political reality. So if I'm elected, I'm not gonna force you off your private health care plan. Congressman Seth Moulton is the 19th Democrat entering the race, but he's no proponent of a single payer so I system. Right. I think every American should have access to good, affordable health care. But I made a commitment to continue getting my own health care at the VA when I was elected to Congress. That's single payer. And I'll tell you, it's not perfect. Bob Moffitt of the Heritage Foundation says that plan is the closest thing in the U.S. to Medicare for all. That is a very bad way to run a health care program. And what we've seen with the Veterans Administration program is something that has been positively scandalous, where you had the bureaucratic manipulation of waiting lists resulting in the delay and the denial of care. And in a number of cases, veterans died. Moffitt contends that cutting private insurance companies out of the equation is a bad solution. The result would be something like um, American medical clinics being turned into the equivalent of Soviet grocery stores. President Trump insists a Republican plan will be ready for a vote after the 2020 election. Moffitt says that's too little too late and that the president should articulate a vision of health care reform now. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abby. And Pat, polls show that health care is the number one issue for voters, even ahead of the economy right now. Well, of course it is. People want to take care of it. I read a very interesting article uh, yesterday about a company in India that uh, is got, they've got, the, you know, uh, Modi is, is the head man over there and it's called Modi Care. And he says, OK, I'm going to give you 1300 bucks for this particular proceeding. And that's all you're going to get. So if you want to get our money, you've got to do this. What is this company doing? They're saying the top specialists should just do their specialty. 
So they do many, many, many operations. They bring in the top guy to, to you know, do the heart transplant and do the, the delicate work, and they leave the rest to the assistants. When a patient is, is in recovery, they don't just have paid nurses, but they bring their family members and teach them how to take care of their loved one who is in recovery. And the costs are down dramatically. I mean, the, 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 the differences are just staggering. But here in America, because of the fact we have so much, uh, well, health care uh, fraud, and we also have uh, health care lawsuits, the litigation over uh, botched abortions and so forth is just extraordinary. They don't permit that in India. They don't have those things. And so as a result, the cost of, they don't need all these referrals. They don't need to back up everything they do with five different opinions. They don't have to send patients around to all these specialties. But somebody comes in, he's the expert, and he does that one thing over and over and over again, and he does it well. Then they've got assistants who do the same thing over and over, and they do it well. And the, the price of things like a heart transplant and a kidney dialysis and so forth are so much lower. And it's good health care. I mean, it's good stuff. They're, they're not uh, dying. They, they, their mortality rate is every bit as good as America. So anyhow, it isn't just the question of paying for it. The reason, one of the reasons that health care is so expensive is that we have disconnected the provider of health care from the recipient of health care and the payer of health care. The one who pays it is not the one who is going to be the recipient. I, if you stay in a hospital, you don't have a clue how much they charge you and what it, all those things are. Have you? That's the truth. You know, it's very, very costly, as anyone who doesn't have insurance that finds themselves in that situation would easily find out. I, I, I remember I, I had a, a knee operation, you know, they scoped a knee, and I got through, and they said, uh, well, we only have to be on crutches for a while. If you want to, would you like some... Uh, you know, therapy. I said, well, what do you got? And they said, well, these are three steps. You, you go up the steps and you go down the steps. So we got a bill. It, it was, I think, $35 for, quote, crutch therapy. I mean, walking up three little steps and back down with a pair of crutches. I mean, this is crazy. But you, you, you have these enormous bills. And then we talk about single payer and the government. If, if you have, if we take away private uh, care, it's ridiculous. But this stuff is insane, and it, it will bankrupt. There is no way there's enough money to do what these guys want. And we have to do exactly what those Indians are doing to, to provide quality. I'm talking about quality health care, every bit of quality, but having specialists just do their specialty and then bringing lesser skilled people to do the next thing and up and down the line. And everybody is doing it over and over and over again, and they're really good. And... The facilities are excellent, and the sanitation is excellent. And well, anyhow, I I don't want to go to India. I, I like it here. Okay, <laughs> John. Pat, President Trump says his administration is making headway against America's opioid crisis, giving a progress report at a summit in Atlanta Wednesday. But as CBN's Jenna Browder explains, while progress has been made, deaths from opioid overdoses continue to climb. President Trump says his administration is making progress in the fight against opioids, investing billions of dollars, and promising to hold drug companies accountable. My administration is deploying every resource at our disposal to empower you, to support you, and to fight right by your side. His speech in Atlanta, do. coming one day after his administration, brought its first criminal charges against a major drug distributor, accusing Rochester Drug Cooperative of turning a blind eye to thousands of suspicious orders for opioid painkillers. We will not solve this epidemic overnight. There's just nothing going to stop us, no matter how you cut it. The president also announcing his administration's commitment to set aside $6 billion for things like youth prevention and overdose reversing drugs. And that's the most ever, and we're going for even bigger numbers this year. Listing other accomplishments, like convincing China to designate fentanyl, or synthetic heroin, as a controlled substance, and cracking down on online sales. 
but critics say it's not enough. Last year, nearly 49,000 Americans died from opioid overdoses. That number up 17 percent from 2017. The top two killers were fentanyl and heroin. Some of the state's hardest hit, New Hampshire, West Virginia, Iowa, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. And in Chicago alone this week. Police are investigating 13 overdoses and four deaths from heroin. We will work, we will pray, and we will fight for the day when every family across our land can live in a drug-free America. And while there's little Republicans and Democrats seem to be able to agree on in Washington, the administration is hopeful this is one area both sides can work together on. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. Pat, certainly a bipartisan issue here. It is, and I commend the president and the administration for bringing lawsuits against these people. They have dumped thousands and hundreds of thousands of these pills out. And this uh, Purdue Pharma was at the, the Sackler family. It was at the heart of so much of this stuff. And they have grown enormously rich. And now uh, there are lawsuits uh, against Purdue Pharma and other of these companies. But the ones who have been in charge of putting out these pills, and the, you know, there was an, an excellent uh, show on 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago about the fact that they twisted the arm of the FDA to say that these opioid pills were good for ongoing care. They were supposed to be good for one time only in the, after an operation or some severe illness where there was extreme pain. And after that, they were supposed to be stopped, but they were not supposed to be continuous. And they talked the FDA into saying it's okay to continue using these things. And that, of course, is one of the things that's hooking people. You know, the thing about opioid addiction, ladies and gentlemen, that's so important to understand is you cannot just go cold turkey off opioids. You can't off some of these other drugs, but you can't off opioids uh, because it does stuff into your brain. So people have to be let down easily. There has to be other drugs that are administered like methadone to get the addicts down. And I, I'm delighted, but those companies should be uh, put behind bars. The executives should be jailed. It is a criminal offense of what they're doing to people. John? Well, Pat, parts of the Deep South are on alert for violent thunderstorms and flash flooding. The storm's already hitting Texas hard with a tornado touching down in College Station Wednesday. Some parts of Texas saw up to a foot of rain. Near Fort Worth, a train carrying ethanol derailed during heavy thunderstorms. And this driver skidded off the road and turned over into a flooded ditch, though he managed to find an air pocket until he could be rescued. Not everyone was so fortunate. A mother and two children died in the floods. The storms, Pat, are expected to move into the Northeast on Friday. Well, uh, it's, weather continues. it's crazy weather we're having, but it's, uh, I don't know what it's responsible for. I'm not gonna talk about global warming or climate change or anything else, but it's been a really rough year. And uh, those caught in those storms, but those storms are moving east and they should be hitting in our area about Friday, I think. Yes, we're due. All right. Well, coming up, an eight-year-old plots his first crime, the murder of his abusive father. My hope was that he would fall asleep and never wake up. And my mom walked in, and I remember turning to her and telling her, just leave it alone, uh, I'll take the blame. His dad lived, but this boy didn't stop trying. Stay tuned for the surprise twist that ended the fights for good. That's next. This is a brutal for one I want to tell you about. Before Casey Diaz had entered his teen years, he already had made what they called his bones. He was in a gang. He had a thirst for blood. He wanted respect, and of course he carried a knife in his hand. But for Casey, stabbing his first victim was easy. Why? He pictured that he was stabbing his own father. I remember trying to push his face towards the gas where the gas uh, was released, and I turned the gas on. Casey Diaz was a mere eight years old 
when he decided to kill his father using a portable gas heater. And my mom walked in on it. It freaked her out. What's going on? And I remember turning to her and telling her, just leave it alone, uh, I'll take the blame. My hope was that he would fall asleep and never wake up. His dad was a violent, abusive alcoholic. He would start literally beating my mom right in front of me. I recall seeing her in, in a closet in her own blood. And there's nothing that you can do. I remember um, in one occasion him grabbing me by the shoulders, bringing me close to him, and he says to me, don't ever call me your dad. Don't ever call me dad. And then I remember just feeling a sense of emptiness. You feel worthless. You feel like, why are you even here? I became angry. I became very angry. Casey would find purpose in a South Central LA gang. He easily became violent, stabbing his first victim at just 11 years old. What made it so easy for me to stab somebody is that I put my, the face of my father on every single one of my victims. More victims would follow, as did a lengthy rap sheet. He rose up in the gang world, feared and hunted by rival gangs. At 16, Casey was sentenced to 12 years in a juvenile correction facility for second-degree murder and 52 counts of armed robbery. He ruled the gang-infested prison until he attacked another inmate. I, I strangled him almost to death. That landed him in solitary confinement at New Folsom State Penitentiary. One day, a Christian woman, Frances, came by to invite him to a monthly Bible study. You're crazy. What are you talking about? Bible study. And I'm going, there. she's nuts. She doesn't know where, who she's talking to. And she says, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to be praying for you. And I'm, I'm putting you on my prayer hit list. You know, she, she uses that word. I said, you can do whatever you want. That's fine. I said, but I'm letting you know right off the bat, uh, I'm not interested in your Bible study or whatever religious thing that you're in. Every month for a year, she came by and Casey declined. But each time, her response was the same. And she would always say to me, I'm praying for you and Jesus is going to use you. In his second year of solitary, he was awake, lying in his bunk. And all of a sudden, um, I start seeing what looks like a movie reel. I'm seeing footage that only I know from me growing up. And it starts to go in, into some details uh, from like the first uh, thing that I ever stole from a 7-Eleven uh, to cars that I stole, uh, to the first stabbing that I partook of. Then a different scene appeared. I could see a man carrying this cross and I saw um, the nails on his hands and his feet. The man addressed Casey by a name. My first name's Darwin. And he says, Darwin, I did this for you. And I could hear in my cell, audibly, his breath leaving him. I hit the center of that floor and wept, weeping uncontrollably, sobbing and telling God, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry for stabbing this person and stabbing this person over here. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew that something had happened here. Like something, there was this freedom that I had never experienced in my life. Casey says Jesus told him to talk to the prison chaplain. He said, what happened in the cell is what happened in the cell. God has already forgiven you. This is why you feel so free. He prayed with the chaplain to accept Christ. Dear Jesus. It was God dealing with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis and removing that desire uh, of, of wanting to hurt people. It just went away um, supernaturally. But Casey's faith would be tested. Now 18, he was released from solitary and a hit was placed on his head for becoming a Christian and leaving the gang. One day, an inmate came to a cell with a knife. And he says, I can't do it. I can't do this. I can't do this to you. He says, but whatever your, 
whatever you're doing, I'll roll with you. And he became the first person. The first person I led to the Lord was the guy that was assigned to do the hit. The hit was removed, and for the remaining five years of his sentence, Casey would lead over 200 inmates to Christ. At age 25, Casey was released. In time, he forgave his dad, who eventually gave his life to Christ as well. Today, Casey owns a successful sign business and lives in LA with his family. Coming to Christ was, is, and will always be the best decision that any man could ever make. He is so relentless in his pursuit of us. He's constantly, you know, you might not notice it right away, but God is after the sinner. But his favor and his mercy and his grace, it just floors you. What a story. I've known you. I died for you. The breath of Jesus went out, and it was for him, for Casey. And he thought, I'm sure he thought, I'm a killer. I've stabbed people. I want to kill my own father. I've killed many people. I'm a gang member. I'm, I'm tough. But you died for me? And the answer was, yes, I died for you. And he saw the breath leaving Jesus. And that was all it took. And I say to you today in this short time we have, that Jesus Christ died for you. He gave his life for you. And I've said it before, and I really mean it. If you were the only person on earth, Jesus would have died for you. But in that was a special moment. And the Lord will give you a special moment. He died for you. And what I'm asking you to do right now is if you haven't given your heart to him, don't say, I'm sin beyond redemption. You haven't. You haven't. There's always hope. If it was hope for a bloodthirsty killer like Casey, there's certainly hope for you. And I'm going to ask you right now to do what Casey did, to pray with me and ask Jesus to come into your heart. He's, he lives. He's alive. Bow your head and pray these words. Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Pray with me. I'm a sinner, Lord. I haven't lived for you. You know all about me. And I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my life. And I ask you to take over. I've made many mistakes. But Lord, I give them all to you. And I receive you now as my Savior. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you've heard my prayer. Thank you that you've come into my heart. Now, if you prayed with me just then, I, I, for some time I've been offering something called a new day. It's a little packet, and in it is a compact disc with some very com uh, condensed, comprehensive teaching on what it means to be a new creature in Christ. And if you'll just call, I'll give this to you free. There's no obligation financially in any shape or form. And along with it is a little booklet that has the scriptures involved that you can read at your leisure. And this will help you get started. I want you to go to your phone now and tell somebody, Jesus died for you. Are you ashamed to admit that you know him? Call. It's 1-800-700-7000. One more time. It's easy to remember. 1-800-TOLL-FREE-700-7000. No finances whatsoever. Just call and say, I prayed with Pat. Gave my heart to Jesus. And we've got an exciting uh, feature coming up for you now that Scott Ross did. I think you'll like it, Terry. Well, still ahead, the man who had the best seat in the house during the Beatles' final concert, their friend Apple Records' Ken Mansfield. A strange thing happened that day. And it was either John looked over at Paul or Paul looked over at John. And it was like they just looked at each other and went, and right at this moment, this is who we are, a good rock and roll band. 
Scott Ross goes behind the music for an insider's look at this historic concert. That's next. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Russian President Vladimir Putin says North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is ready to move forward in getting rid of his nuclear weapons, but needs security guarantees first. The two met for a summit in Russia's Far East today. Putin said he's willing to share details of his meeting with President Trump. The Russian summit comes as the North hopes to get out from under international sanctions over its nuclear weapons and long-range missile programs. Well, here at home, as Democrats decide whether to impeach uh, President Trump, he's saying he wouldn't let the move stand. Warning Wednesday on Twitter, if partisan Democrats ever tried to impeach, I would first head to the U.S. Supreme Court. Not only are there no high crimes and misdemeanors, there are no crimes by me at all. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is urging members of her party to hold off on impeachment, but some say they're ready to move forward. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Mansfield had a first-hand glimpse of Beatlemania and a front-row seat on the day that it ended. Recently, Ken sat down with Scott Ross and talked about the first time he met the Fab Four, the legendary rooftop concert, and his enduring message for Beatles fans. After a storied career as a music executive, including a gig with Apple Records, Ken Mansfield says the high point came atop a roof in London. It was a cold January day in 1969. Ken was one of a few spectators at a private performance of the legendary Beatles, all told in his newest book, The Roof. The Roof. What roof? What are you talking about? <laughs> the top of the Apple Building in Savile Row in downtown London. And the Beatles, of course, were well known to my wife, Nedra with the Ronettes, because they toured together. Exactly. That rooftop session was recorded for the Beatles' Let It Be film, but it wasn't just another performance. And actually, the Beatles had not played together. In two years. Two years? Yeah. And all of a sudden, the last time they were ever playing together? Time. A strange thing happened that day. Now, I'm sitting about four to six feet away from them, and they started playing, and it was either John looked over at Paul or Paul looked over at John, and it was like they just looked at each other and went, you know what, this is us. We've been mates for a long time. We've done things nobody's ever done. We've been close forever. And right at this moment, this is who we are, a good rock and roll band. Mm -hmm. I wrote my favorite line in the book. I said they came up on the roof without a sound check, but they went back down the stairs with a soul check. How well did you get along with the lads? You were with them a lot. I got along with them real well. The interesting thing is when they, I worked with them in 65, and that was when they were just super on top, you know. It was only the second time they came to America. And uh, I was this young guy with a suntan and uh, Cadillac convertible living in the Hollywood Hills in a house in a pool. And now they're working with a young guy their age. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they start asking me a bunch of questions, like where's Mulholland Drive? And uh, Ringo wanted to know if I could introduce him to Buck Owens because Buck was on Capitol. <laughs> and uh, that started a relationship, both as a business relationship and a personal relationship that developed out of that. Looking back now, what do you want to convey? Well, I want to convey that uh, they were really nice guys. Yeah. I know they weren't perfect, and I know they had some times, <laughs> and those times got more publicity than anything, but they were real people. I wanted people to get the feeling what it was like to be around them. So I also like, spent a lot of personal time with them, and uh, there was just this sense of they were I use the word common because they grew up common, you know, mm -hmm. and they never left that. How did it affect you years later when John was shot yeah. and George died? Yeah, mainly when John died because the dream was over. The Beatles were never going to re reunite. And my sense of loss was not, wow, I lost a friend, I lost an associate, I lost something like that. My feelings was I went back into the universal sadness that we all shared, that everybody shared around the world. No more songs, you know, no more craziness, <laughs> no more Beatles reuniting. And so 
Uh, it was a very, very emotional day. And, and George, and of course. George, yeah. Well, George, we had time to think about, and we knew he was going. But it was John who, that famous quote that got him in a lot yeah. of trouble, that they were more popular than Jesus yeah. now. Uh, how did that affect uh, the thinking of the, of the band and their lives at that point? Well, John, and he, he, he has talked about this several times, and he told me, he said, that I was just trying to make a point. There's something wrong with the youth today, that they're worshiping a band mm -hmm. instead of worshiping like Jesus. Where did Jesus intersect your life? Uh, he intersected my life uh, when I was about as down as far as you could go. And uh, then I met uh, a young, beautiful lady who became my wife. And I had a guru and I was broke and I was a stoner and, and I was bad news then. And uh, one day she called and she said, we need to talk. And she said, I see where our relationship is going and I have to make a choice between you and Jesus and I choose Jesus. Whoa. I went home and I thought, I want something to be so dear to me that I'm willing to give up something that's very important to me, which was our relationship. I thought, uh, I want that. I want that more than anything. I became the spiritual head of our relationship. And I mean, I devoured the Bible. I didn't read anything but the Bible for three years. I mean, I was just all in. This brings us, you know, again to the book. Why did you write it? What do you want to say to people? I realized what I had here was a chance for ministry. I'm a seed planter, and it was just a way to plant seeds. I wasn't trying to make a sale. I was just trying to plant some seeds. I thought, I've got the Beatles fans, and I'm, I'm staying true to them. You know, I'm giving them all the things they want to know. So at the end, I want to talk to them about God now. Fascinating. Boy, he yeah. did have a front row seat to many things. You know, I, I really appreciate those guys. I mean, they were so creative. They, they, they put out about 260 or 70 original songs. I mean, they were very prolific. I mean, they, they, they go among the top composers of the world, and they, they weren't just singing other people's stuff. It was their own, and it was just terrific. One, one record after the other is amazing. Yeah, well, they were, remember when they first came to America, they were on the Ed Sullivan show oh, every man. time they came, and it was, it, it really impacted the culture. Totally. Yeah. Unbelievable. Anyways, but I mean, yeah. it was just amazing how creative they were. I mean, they just whipped out song after song after song, and, you know, Paul McCartney was, being interviewed, he said, I can't even read music. And they would come into the, he'd know yeah. exactly how the sounds are supposed to go. An amazing, amazing Very group. Talented. Anyhow, Very talented. that's part of our culture. All right. <laughs> well, still ahead, Pat's going to weigh in on the issues that matter to you. Rhonda asks, is it wrong for me to accept a gift from a ministry in appreciation for my donation? Well, get ready for another round of your questions and some honest answers when we come back. Christine Halchek and her father, Wallace, are financial planners. They've spent their careers managing money and helping people plan for their future. Now, Christine and Wallace want to tell you the secret to financial freedom. Wallace Vosge and Christine Halchek are a father-daughter team at a successful financial planning firm in Tampa, Florida. Both enjoy being partners at the firm. Seeing the clients at different stages of their lives and then helping them through some of the choices that they need to make. And we know we did our job and we took care of them and they're thankful. It's just a very rewarding profession. Christine is married with a family of her own now, but as a child, she remembers learning important lessons from her parents, including about tithing and giving. She noticed when they shared stories that couldn't be explained as coincidence, like the time her father pledged to give $1,000 he didn't have. About two weeks later, I received a, a commission on a, um, an investment that I was unaware the gentleman was going to invest in that way. And uh, it came out that I had a commission of approximately $1,000. So it was returned. The more we are blessed, the more we can give. And it's more joyful to give than to receive. One of the places where Wallace and Christine give is CBN. It's phenomenal that they have the Well Project. It's just a wonderful gift to those communities that are very remote. 
Operation Blessing is always there. The trucks roll and people are helped. The program Helping the Home Front is a phenomenal new program to work with these military families and encourage their faith. Superbook, I was very impressed on the spreading of the gospel throughout the world. Orphans Promise is doing a beautiful job of helping these orphans that otherwise would be left. And instead, now they're chosen. This father-daughter team plans to keep giving to CBN for a long time to come. The gift is for the giver. It's not about the organization that's asking for the funds. It's about doing the right thing that the Lord has put on your heart to do. It's important to open your mind and open your pocketbook and, and let the Lord in because He's an amazing God. We really appreciate people like the Hellchucks. I mean, they're terrific people, but there's so many thousands of people who are, make up the uh, family of CBN and Operation Blessing, and we just really appreciate all of you and thank God for you. Now, how do you become a 700 Club member? It's real easy. Uh, it's 65 cents a day. That's less than, a, I mean, a lot less than a can of soda pop. Uh, and we're talking about $20 a month, and then you become a member, and then next thing you know, you increase, and you, you're giving 40 or you're giving 1,000 or whatever. But for those who do, I, I want to give you a, a DVD called The I Wills of God. I saw in the 91st Psalm these uh, series of uh, promises that God made. He said, because he, they've set their love upon me, Therefore, I will. And then he goes down the list of the things. I will deliver them. I will honor them with long life. I will satisfy them. I will protect them from uh, evil and so forth. And it's just a wonderful thing. And we've got examples of people who have been protected by the power of God. So we'll send this to you. The I wills of God is our gift to you. Uh, and along with that, well, we'll ask you to call in and say, you can count on me as a 700 Club member. Okay? Great. Terry. Yes. Okay. Well, let's take some questions here. Right. Are you ready? Go for it. Okay, Pat, this first one comes from Rhonda, who says, Is it wrong for me to accept a gift from a ministry in appreciation for my donation, which is my tithe? Does it nullify it as a tithe? Uh, we give out a little thing like this to those who are giving, and this is, uh, it, it's not, if it had a price to it, I don't know what it would sell with on, on the market, but it's not a whole lot. Uh, Frankly, I, I, I don't think ministries ought to be giving away uh, expensive gifts. And, you know, the, the IRS makes it clear if you get back a substantial gift, uh, it diminishes the value of the tax deduction. But uh, I don't think, uh, I don't want ministries, if I'm giving money, I don't want them taking my money and giving it back to me. You know, I want them to use it. And so uh, lavish gifts and parties and trips and things like that for free, uh, that, that's, that'll diminish the thing. And it, in my opinion, it's, it's not a good thing. So you say, is it wrong to accept it all? You know, but it, it, it does diminish the value uh, from a tax standpoint of what you've, you've given, all right? Okay, this is a viewer who says, I am a Christian and part of the LGBT community. I've accepted God into my heart. I was confused by the segment on Chris, who left the gay lifestyle on Tuesday's show. It made it seem like LGBT people weren't loved by God. Last time I read the Bible, I'm pretty sure it says that God loves everyone, doesn't he? Um, of course he loves you. Of course he loves lesbians. He loves homosexuals. He loves transgenders. He loves all these people. But... He also loves people who are heterosexual, but he doesn't condone heterosexuals going out and practicing fornication or adultery. And so if you practice homosexual sex, the Bible says it's wrong. So does God love you any less? No, but he does say if you're doing it, you're going to wind up away from him. And if you read Romans, it's very clear that this is the last stage of Gentile apostasy when people said, you know, God gave them up to unnatural passions. You know, when, when God gives them up 
and they begin, women begin lusting after women, men begin lusting after men, that this is the final stage. So does God love them less? You, you, you look at the wrong thing. It's what you're doing that's important. And what he says is clean up your act. All right. Okay, this is Mitchell who says, I'm scared. To be honest, I feel I'm beyond God's forgiveness. I feel like I can't be forgiven. I've asked for forgiveness, but don't know if I've been forgiven. Any help, please? I'm just scared. You know, why don't you believe what God says? Uh, he says very clearly, if you walk in the light as I'm in the light, uh, you have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse you. So if you believe in my word, and believe in him who sent me, you have everlasting life. Read the Bible and take the promises and do not allow your heart to be condemned. We leave you with today's power minute. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, my unfailing love you will not be shaken.